Okay, action. Okay, this is uh, Sandra Barrett Hassan of Washington, D.C. Uh, this is April 26, uh, 2013, right? And um, we're interviewing you because you're a native Washingtonian that was involved in a lot of important things that happened in the 60s. You're second or third generation Washingtonian, right? Third. Third generation. Where'd you grow up and tell us a little bit about your early background. Okay. Um, I grew up in various sections of Washington, starting off from age, um, from birth to two at um, 748 Q Street Northwest. And after that, my parents moved to Moore Street Northeast, Ivy City, Trinidad, uh, 1172 Moore Street. And from there, they moved to the Gold Coast on Blagdon Avenue in Northwest Washington. Um, <clears throat> but I spent 10 years on, on Moore Street Northeast, and those were an interesting 10 years. I was two years old when I moved there, and um, by the time I was five, that's when I knew I was an African American. I knew by the time I was five, I was a Negro. Um, because that's the term, uh, I think, that we used at that time. Um, what it meant in, in sort of very practical sense was that um, I could not go to the school which was around the corner from me and ironically enough that was uh, Phyllis Wheatley <laughs> Elementary School but it was segregated and um, I you know I couldn't go there and in fact I don't think uh, we were permitted to play on the playground but all the little kids in the neighborhood black and white played together and so, but it was at five when things began to change. Uh, and, you know, it was all around going to school. Um, but one of the interesting things that happened was the, the, uh, the white kids in the neighborhood were going to Glen Echo and to Marshall Hall in the summer. I mean, real exciting stuff, you know, but we couldn't go. Those were big amusement parks. Uh, right, that was a big amusement yeah. park just outside of Washington, D.C. And, um, and so I talked with my parents about, uh, about uh, a petition. And I said, we're going to petition the President of the United States, my sister and I, uh, because we know he's going to believe in fairness, and this is not fair. This just isn't right. So we took this little piece of paper, we wrote something up, and I don't remember quite You're what it was. You're five years old. Oh no, I was about seven, oh, okay. well, and my sister was a year and a half older, so, um, and <laughs> we took this petition, so it had my signature, my sister's signature, and we went around the neighborhood, and we got a few other signatures, but I'll never forget the one man's signature that I couldn't quite understand. And maybe I was a little younger because I could, I could read. And he had written John Doe. And I thought, well, that can't be his name. Uh, he's Italian. He's got one of these long names. Well, that can't be right. It's just a few. And I didn't at that time know what John Doe meant. Yeah. But he'd rather be anonymous than actually sign the petition. So I think with the five signatures we had, we sent it off to, <laughs> to the president. We didn't get a response. But, you know, when you're kids, you sort of move on to the next thing. I mean, you're just having fun. <laughs> who, who was the president? Uh, Eisenhower. Eisenhower. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, um, were your parents activists or just supportive of your activism? I mean, how did you come about this? Boy, that's, that's interesting. I don't really know. Now, my father was, he and my uncle had some interest in, in the union movement, and this was decades ago, uh, a half century ago. <laughs> In the 50s. In the, in the 50s, yes, in the 40s and 50s. And, and I think there was some association with um, a group of communists who were organizing black workers. And so 
that I know my father and my uncle were involved in. Um, and I don't know any more about it than that. Um, but uh, in truth, I think probably uh, it was my elementary school teachers who sort of got instilled in me some kind of awareness that that um, we were living in a in a segregated system that was not right, not fair, and that we could do something about it. And so, you know, hence things like the, uh, <clears throat> the petition and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, so but, you know, I was still very a, young then. It came from a community feeling that there was something wrong. It was not just the church or your parents. It was the school and presumably the larger community that was, had this awareness. Sure. Program. The school, the community, the church. Yes. All yes. Of All of the above. I mean, we absolutely felt very, very safe in, in our community. You know, we had places we could go. And we did not go beyond those places. I mean, while the, while the little kids in my neighborhood there in Ivy City were going off to Glen Echo, uh, the little kids in my neighborhood would go off to Union Station. And we would sort of swim, as we called it, in the fountain out there. Or we would go down to what is now called Heckinger Mall. But at that time, there was a Sears at the Heckinger Mall. And the Sears had outdoor um, uh, play equipment for display. Well, we'd go and play on the play equipment. We were just fine, you know, with, with our alternatives. So, yes. yeah. Uh, any other thoughts or uh, um Remembrances of growing up in segregated Washington. You were born in the mid '40s, right? Yeah. So you were. Yeah. Well, there, there were some things that that happened that were really quite disturbing now, and at the time I didn't realize it, um, though my parents did. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, on one occasion, my sister and I, who had to take, what is it, two buses and a streetcar to go across town to go to school since the school closest to home was segregated. And um, on one occasion, we're heading off to school, and the bus driver uh, let my sister on the bus but closed the door behind her. And so I was stuck on the sidewalk and, you know, I didn't know what to do, you know, I was panicking, and it was the other people on the bus that insisted that the bus driver stop, because I'm running after the <laughs> bus, running after my sister. And at that time, I didn't realize what was going on, you know, why had this thing happened. I just thought it was a mistake, but people on the bus understood, um, you know, we were little. And I don't know why what, people what, would do that, that to little kids. What, what, why did that happen? Um, because the bus driver just, you know, had in his mind that he could, um, you know, we can call it discriminate and, and, and act it out in this way. Um, we, we had another uh, situation on the transportation system, um, and this time it was on the streetcar. Uh, Again, we had to take two buses and a streetcar, <laughs> or two streetcars and a bus. <laughs> and back then you had paper transfers. So when you got off one, you used the transfer to get on another one. So when the both of us were uh, attempting to get on another streetcar, uh, the driver said, your transfer is no good. And we looked at it, and we looked at them, and we thought they were good, but here was authority telling us that they were no good. And so we kind of said, okay, well, they must not be good. And again, we were very young. And so we walked, uh, actually this time, to my grandmother's house. And we walked and we walked and we walked and we walked and we walked. Well, everybody got concerned. My grandmother, where are they? Where are they? Where are they? Call my parents, where are they? Where are they? 
So we finally got to my grandmother's house and we explained what had happened. And my mother just doesn't take anything off of anybody. So she immediately sort of got, you know, got on the phone or, you know, however she had to communicate with people that this was not right, this was wrong. You know, if you want to go, why go after little kids, you know, and so, but those are the only two things aside from, well, we had H Street, we had 14th Street, we had U Street, you know, we had certain areas that we knew were, in a sense, ours and, and safe you know, part of 7th Street. So that, that, that's kind of like, uh, you know, we sort of restricted ourselves. Uh, uh, but not by choice. What was the school you were being, that you had to go? See? Parkview Elementary School. Which is? Uh, which is on Water Street and Princeton, if that rings a bell with you, uh, in Northwest near Georgia Avenue and um, between Georgia Avenue and Water Street, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, some, it's called something else now. It's either a charter school or some other kind of uh, learning center, but I'm not sure. I just have one other question on all this stuff. Uh, the, 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 you mentioned the, the streetcars, which of course people have come to Washington in recent years know nothing about. They ran until about 1963, and you could catch one right from your, near, near your house? Well, the streetcars were everywhere, yeah. Mm -hmm. We could catch streetcars, uh, you know, we can jump ahead to high school, and I remember taking the uh, streetcar under DuPont Circle, and uh, when they finally closed down the streetcars in 1963, they left the underground open. And so in high school, kids, we used to go down there and play underground. And then they developed it for a hot minute, and then that was gone, and then they walled it off. But yeah, yeah, streetcars. And when one broke down, that was it. When we'd have a bad snow and one streetcar stopped, no other one could come. So that was it. <laughs> Sandy, where did you go to high school? I went to Western High School, okay. uh, which is now Duke Ellington School for the Arts. And I think that's where I really became an activist with intelligence. You know, I may have been an activist as a kid, but it was, you know, um, uh, well. So what was it like at, at the old Western High School when you, when you went in? It would have been the uh, early 60s or the late 50s? From 1960 to 1963, right. I was at Western. Yeah. Well, it was interesting because Western had just uh, a couple of years earlier opened its boundaries. So people uh, from outside the immediate community could go to that school. So a lot of parents uh, over, you know, I guess it's called the Gold Coast, but Crestwood were sending their, their children there. And so that's how my sister and I, my sister who preceded me, um, ended up going to Western High School. Um, boy, was that an eye opener. <laughs> it really was. Well, first of all, we're traveling across town to Georgetown, which is its own, you know, sort of unique enclave. Um, we're also, um, interestingly enough, we still had the track system in Washington, D.C. So we had those of us coming from uh, Crestwood, and then we also had African American kids coming from Foggy Bottom, and the inclination was to put us all in one of the lower tracks, the general track or the basic track. I mean, that was just like, th that's, that's what's supposed to happen. Not in honors, not in college prep, but general and basic. So uh, <clears throat> I think I was placed in the general track, I'm not sure. But once again, my mother <laughs> came up to the school and said, no, <laughs> no, you know, if you need to, Tester, this isn't right. 
And so, you know, that didn't last too long. I moved up. I can't remember whether I was in college prep or honors, but at any rate, <laughs> yeah. Um, but those are the... But was it that experience, of the tracking experience, that made you an activist? Was that one part of it? Or was that... You know, Anne, the movement really started in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And it was just building and mushrooming. And I think by the time I was, you know, a teenager, I was aware that there was something happening, something great that was happening, and I'm going to get on that train and be a part of it. Um, I think that's sort of where it came from. Yeah. So uh, that was one of our questions, you know, to talk about how did you feel like so many of us felt in the early 60s with the sit-ins and the Freedom Rides, and then Kennedy's election, which seemed so hopeful. Did you feel a surge of hope then? Or was oh, that, absolutely. Was that but even uh, before then, when, when I was um, in high school, my sister really introduced me to uh, the nonviolent action group on of the Howard. campus of Howard University. And we had meetings at our house. And so I couldn't wait to graduate high school and go to Howard so that I could, you know, be, join this sort of hotbed of, you know, of activism. And um, it was interesting, the meetings at the house, because, you know, it was Stokely Carmichael and Cortland Cox and, you know, all, all of the... Uh, Michael Fellwell, uh, you know, these were, these were heroes to me. These were, you know, um, even Marion Barry came <laughs> to one of the meetings at the house. Um, and I just uh, knew that, that this was, you know, something really big and something very important and something I wanted to be a part of. And so once I graduated and got to Howard, there really was a shock for me because, you know, the activist, you could count, you know, on your fingers and toes, so to speak. And, and that was a, a big surprise to me because I thought everybody at Howard was like this group that was meeting at my house, <laughs> you know. So um, in 63, when I got to Howard, um, <clears throat> You know, and I may not have all of the dates quite right and the time quite right, but pretty quickly there, thereafter, um, uh, the Nonviolent Action uh, Group became SNCC, SNCC. Student yeah. Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And, and that's, well, the other thing that's interesting is that the, you know, men were always prominent as leaders of the movement. And at Howard, people like Stokely Carmichael, people like uh, Michael Selwell, they were all um, from the Caribbean, and and I think they brought with them, you know, a great deal more intolerance <laughs> for the system that they found themselves in when they came to go to school here in the U.S. And uh, so they were really, you know, the the uh, strident, um, uh, you know, revolutionary. Um, you know, the vanguard of the movement. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so th that's one thing I recall. Uh, lots Michael of recollections. Thelwell, by the way, Michael Thelwell wrote a book that's uh, recently published about that period. Uh, and he said, he described what it was like being the kind of activist that he and Stokely and Cortland Cox, all those people were, um, and that the university, did, Howard did not support them at all. Oh, no, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah. Not, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> they were on their own. Well, Howard, I mean, I'm, I, I have to, um, uh, oh my goodness, the, one of the deans, uh, Frank Snowden, he would say, Howard is the black 
Harvard. And he said it in such an affected way. And, and you felt that. Now, we weren't talking strictly academics. It was also a culture. Um, and yeah, there was still a lot of, you know, a bourgeoisie kind of, you know, feel to Howard University. Um, a lot of women went there and hung around the School of Architecture, the School of Dentistry, the School of Medicine because they were looking, you know, for a spouse. Um, we had all the sororities and the fraternities and they certainly were very well recognized, but SNCC was not, you know. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the music department didn't have a jazz studies component. Um, African studies was not open to undergraduates. You had to be on the graduate level. I mean, stuff that was really relevant to our life experience, you know, wasn't you know, readily sort of available there. And, and um, the uh, sororities and fraternities most of those members were not involved in the civil rights movement. So there was almost a, just a clear divide. And I may be misspeaking, folks. <laughs> Someone's going to correct me, I'm sure. <laughs> the Howard administration, of course, depended on the federal government. They didn't want to have... Well, sure. Uh, they didn't want to have um, controversy. Uh, well, and there was controversy. With the Southern Democrats <laughs> controlling things up there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, uh, when you were at Howard, did you do any, um, and, and, and SNCC had just started, um, did you do any sort of local actions with uh, SNCC? I know they went to the Eastern Shore and there were a few other things that they were doing. Did you participate in any of those? No, I say pretty much, pretty much at home. I, uh, <clears throat> I uh, participated in a, a great number of sympathy demonstrations. And so like uh, at Woolworths and you know other sort of convenience stores that, uh, or chain stores that weren't uh, serving African Americans in the South or had some discriminatory uh, policy. Um, you know, I, I worked in the office a little bit. Um, you know, the, I think I was really kind of on the periphery, but my well, head and my heart, <laughs> yes. That's what you're well, yeah. and you, and and uh, <clears throat> I, I think there, the movement was made up of 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 a lot of of support people, as as you said. Uh, you know, we had a number of big leaders, big names, but it really was from the ground up. It really was a groundswell of little people who made a big difference. Uh, and back in high school, I was doing something called uh, uh, testing restaurants. And so a group of us, a, a mixed group would, of us, would go out to various restaurants in Virginia and see if we got served as, as a mixed group. And we never did. We never did. And um, uh, Virginia is a very, very strange place. And to this day, Virginia is a very strange place. Um, someone may correct me on that one also, <laughs> but <laughs> that's just my opinion. <laughs> Um, how about the 63 March? That was a big year in 1963. Did you go to that? Oh, yes, I went to that march. I was a marshal at the, at the march because I was very much involved with SNCC at that time. And um, I was a great, I was a distance away from the staging area. And that really kind of like, oh my, my, I'm way over here, but I'm going to do my job. I had my little white cap on, and I'm going to stand in this corner, and I'm going to usher people into, you know, the larger area where everything is going on. I could hear, because the loudspeakers were there, but I couldn't see anything. And lo and behold, 
Malcolm X walks into my little, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, uh, and so I did my job, you know, I'm uh, escorting him, you know, over to where he's supposed to go next and that sort of thing, you know. But of course now, he's surrounded by the fruit of Islam, so he doesn't really, <laughs> and also the press. <laughs> but nevertheless, this was my <laughs> little quadrant, and I'm doing, uh, and it was just fascinating because he had said that he wasn't coming to this march. I mean, he didn't believe in it. But there he was. And, um, you know, he said, I think, if I got it correctly, that he could not not come. Um, so, yeah, that, you know, as it turned out to me, I, I felt like I was in the presence of greatness. I did. I have to admit, I felt like I was in the presence of greatness. And it could be all of the you know, the sort of entourage that, that surrounded him, you know, with the press and all of this. Right. But, um, yeah, it was, it was a very significant day for me, that beautiful, crystal clear, just, just an incredible day. Fifty years ago. Fifty years ago, 50 yeah. Fifty years ago this year. Yeah. And it changed, it changed things. Yes, it did. It was a big year of change. Leading up to that, there were all these mainly politicians that were warning about this is terrible that all these people are going to be. Oh, here. I know. Describe that sort of the, what you saw as this outside atmosphere, but what, what contrasted with the reality of what went on. Well, uh, you know, the black church, especially in the South, you know, was so influential. In, 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 in moving people, getting people, you know, to, you know, t to be active for just justice. And so uh, there was, and we spent a lot of time uh, talking about how to, to be uh, nonviolent, uh, but, but the 63 March was just a whole bunch of black and white folks who were there to make a statement not to cause trouble. And so many of them were just good, good church going brothers and sisters. And they would not, they would not show out in any way. You know, they were there, there was a purpose, and they were going to act with the dignity that that uh, purpose required. And that's, that's how that went. Uh, but politicians, <laughs> I mean, we, that goes back to Virginia <laughs> in a strange way. <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of fear. And SNCC, in particular, um, had a whole other idea of what that march should be like. I mean, they wanted to lay down, you know, we, because I was a part of SNCC, we were going to shut stuff down and lay down in the streets and, you know, put our bodies across the bridges and stuff like that. And, and uh, you know, that didn't happen. But there were a lot of um, sort of cooler heads to, who prevailed, you know. So, no, this is, this is, this is going to be different from that. This, yeah. Well, you were very involved in, in SNCC and <coughs> local actions. And uh, what, have, what followed after that particular sort of period ended, um, the civil rights activism? Uh, and about six, well, with the Voting Rights Act, it ended in 65, I think. I mean, what, what did you find that you were doing, drawn to politically and personally after those years? Well, um, I can say that the, uh, many of the African countries had begun to, to get their independence. And, you know, this is a little earlier. Both these things were happening simultaneously, the civil rights movement and the independence of African nations. And I really got into learning something about my African heritage. 
and I began to work with a group called the African Heritage Dancers and Drummers. I began to sort of dance and, and study under Melvin Deal. <laughs> and, um, and so I sort of went in, in that direction culturally, yeah, you know. And you've been really, I've known you quite a few years and I've always known you as a community activist and an artist. That's how I think of you, right? <laughs> Both of those things. But you have stayed close to home and done a lot of things here in Washington, D.C. that and in your neighborhood that have improved the life of people here and your daughters. Your daughters grew up Washingtonians also. Yeah. Uh, how do you think things were different for your girls? Oh, very different, very different. First of all, you know, I consider those years, uh, you know, from the 50s, you know, through the 60s, as uh, the era of great, you know, optimism and activism. Mm -hmm. And uh, that it was wonderful to be a young person growing up at that, at that time. Uh, my kids miss that. They miss that altogether. Uh, you know, they are four, in their 40s now. And they grew up in a very different time uh, when they were in high school. Uh, and I, it, it wasn't particularly a pleasant time. Uh, Where did they go to high school? They both went to school without walls. Oh, downtown. Right. And, and actually, when I say it wasn't a pleasant time, I'm talking about, you know, the whole era of drug activity that was going on. And uh, uh, my children actually have been to more funerals than I have. Um, and, I, I, you know, they did not have that same kind of experience that I did growing up, and which is one reason I made the quilt for them, mm -hmm. so that they would have a sense of, of, of what we went through to get here. So when my kids or anyone else says, well, I'm not going to vote in this particular election or something like that, I say, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute. People fought and died for you to have this privilege, you know. Uh, and for, as far as I'm concerned, it's an obligation. You must. So, you know, Yes. That being said, let's bring out a, one of your art pieces and maybe hold it up. Can we hold it up uh, against the wall? And I made this quilt so that my children, my grandchildren, would know something about that era in, in which um, I was a teenager. Uh, I started off really first with just the acronyms. One of my children to know the major organizations that were involved in, in, in the movement. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, um, the Southern Christian Leadership Council, and the Congress of Racial Equality. When I take this quilt to schools now, and I do sometimes use it as a teaching tool, the kids don't know this. They recognize NAACP, but they don't know any of the other organizations. Um, so in the summer of 64, a lot of people went south to work in uh, Mississippi and in other states and set up freedom schools. So this, was, this panel was uh, for the freedom schools. Uh, the Montgomery bus boycott, which lasted more than a year, this is my representation. Lift Every Voice is the Negro National Anthem, that's what we call it, We Shall Overcome. Well, that was the uh, battle cry. Uh, Greensboro sit-in. Million Man March doesn't really belong here, so <laughs> it is not of that era. <laughs> But somehow I, <laughs> I put it there. Uh, Malcolm and, and Martin, I mean, they were, you know, had different uh, philosophical views of what needed to happen in this country. And in many ways, there was a playoff of each, each one. Uh, uh, politicians were scared to death of Malcolm, so they accepted Martin. <laughs> and and uh, at least that's, that's kind of my take on it. 
uh, March on Washington, voter registration drives. And, and this was my little statement about being uh, an activist in D.C. during the March on Washington. Oh. You guys getting oh, that's tired? <laughs> Thank you. I know you Thank had to gotten tired. Um, well, a couple more questions. Maybe John has one too. Yeah, but yeah. Um, I was going to ask you. Thank you. That's oh, so yeah. beautiful. We only have. How 63 was a big year. Um, 68 was also a big year. And I wondered what, what your memories of the, you know, the assassination of Martin Luther King. I mean, I lived in Washington oh, oh then too. Oh what a, what a week. God. But what, what was your experience and what did you take away from that? Well, in 1968, I was living at 1620 Fuller Street. Mm -hmm. And I will say that <clears throat> in the floor above me, there was uh, Ed Brown, who was Rap Brown's brother. There was um, Cortland Cox, um, Ralph Featherstone, and Frank Smith. The four of them lived in the apartment above, one floor above me. Uh, I was working for the Drum and Spear bookstore, uh, which is there at 14th and Fairmont. <clears throat> and so when the riot uh, after his assassination towns across the country were enraged and riots ensued and so <clears throat> um, I it was just a, such a, a sad and angry time uh, we were sad we were mad, and in our madness, we went about destroying our neighborhoods. Uh, 14th Street was destroyed. 7th Street was destroyed. Um, my now husband was uh, shepherding people in and out of the city, and at one point, he was in Maryland, he couldn't get back into the city because it had been cordoned off. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we, we went over to one of the highest points in the city, which was over there at, at, at Georgetown University, and went into one of the taller buildings there, and I don't remember the names of these buildings, and just watched the city. We had a panoramic view of the city uh, in flames in flames. Yeah. It was a hard time. Yeah. I remember it as very surreal, the tanks coming down New Hampshire Avenue and oh. things like that. <clears throat> but it was a sort of defeating time for people who were involved in the movement, I think. It felt like some sort of terrible defeat and loss. No, it was a terrible loss. Um, and I... I don't think I took it so much as a defeat um, as, as being propelled to work harder. We've got to, we can't let it die. We can't let the movement die. We've got to work harder, you know. And, and I think, I, you know, I was still pretty young, and so I hadn't become as jaded as I've become <laughs> now. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> but really, I, I, I was very hopeful. Uh, but I was also a little lost. I think a lot of us were a little lost. Uh, <clears throat> you know, well, what do we do now? You know, uh, we had come to depend on, on, on uh, not just his leadership, but his brilliance. I mean, he was a brilliant man. His his oratory could move mountains, <laughs> you know. So uh, yeah, yeah. Do you have anything else you want to add? Uh, just a reference earlier when you were uh, uh, fighting, your mother was fighting the the tracking track system, and then the Hobson v. Hansen case came down. Yes. I think that was around 1968. Mm -hmm. Also, right around in there. 
was that anything you were involved in or you were not directly yeah. not directly yeah. but yes yes of course we were uh, applauding that yeah um, uh, Julius Hobson uh, was one of the people that I worked with in the whole student young student movement mm -hmm. uh, I think be, even before I got involved with um, uh, SNCC on Howard's campus I was doing stuff as a high schooler with Julius Hobson around the track system and other disparities in, in the school system here in, in D.C. And um, yeah, uh, Julius Hobson and his friend Rim, Rimsky Atkinson, I don't know if you remember those names, but yeah, they were, they, they sort of work with Rimsky in particular, work with us students to, to uh, uh, you know, to open our eyes to see really what was going on and not just accept what was going on as, well, this is the way it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah. Yeah, when you were mentioning about the SNCC people all coming from the uh, Caribbean area, that so many of the uh, other prominent activists of the time came from outside of D.C. to like uh, Hobson and Doug Moore and the whole, right. whole raft of people. Yeah. That, uh, but there was a lot going on inside D.C. Right. too in the churches and the, yeah, I mean. Mm -hmm. One last question, if you look at those years 1960 to 75, um, what are the things that you're gladdest that you did or you feel most proud of or you remember the most fondly? You're asking a very hard question. <laughs> I, I don't think I could really answer that. Um, I liked everything I was doing at that time, uh, whether it was working at the New Thing Art and Architecture Center, whether it was working on the study of, of black English, uh, uh, Dancing, yeah. I mean, I got married during that time, and I had two ch two children. So all of that happened uh, during that decade. It, it was just a that was a great time. <laughs> it was a good time. I met you. <laughs> right. That's that's. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Yes, this has been great. Thank you very much. Uh, this is, uh, okay. Thank you for your time. You get to see this whole thing at some point. <sighs>